अब आगे लाइव गुड मॉर्निंग स्टूडेंट्स फोर्थ डे ऑफ अवर ट्रेनिंग प्रोग्राम दैट इज द सर्टिफिकेट कोर्स ऑन इम्यूनोलॉजिकल टेक्निक एंड टूडे सेशन विल बी कंडक्टेड बाय मिस दीप्ति गुलाटी एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर इन द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी और डॉल्फिन इंस्टीट्यूट एंड शी हैज वेरी लॉन्ग एक्सपोजर ऑफ टीचिंग बायोटेक्नोलॉजी स्टूडेंट स्पेशली इम्यूनोलॉजी एंड शी विल बी डिमोन्स्ट्रेटिंग two techniques today in fact you will be uh, exposed with the techniques uh, you will be doing hands on training also and those techniques are single radial immunodiffusion and double immunodiffusion so please join me in welcoming welcoming ms jitri gulati kon thole ये वाला एफ फाइव से नहीं बोला Then what will happen? They will agglutinate 
That is another form of interaction between an antigen and antibody. For that, the antigen will be insoluble. So if the antigen is soluble, it interacts with the antibodies, soluble. They form an insoluble product, which is known as a residue. So what we do is we incubate soluble antigens with soluble antibodies at proper pH. We have to give them proper conditions. We give them proper pH. We give them proper temperature. We give them electrolytes, mainly salt, that is NaCl. And in presence of these conditions, they interact with each other. If they are specific to each other, they will interact with each other. And we will get a product. And that product is known as a resistant state. Right? So two soluble reactants, they come together to form one insoluble product and that product is known as precipitation. Now in precipitation reactions, the antigens are also known as precipitinogens. And the antibodies are also known as precipitins. So we can also call antigens in precipitation reactions as precipitinogens. And we can call the antibodies as a precipitin. So there are certain features, there are certain characteristics of the precipitation reactions. One of the important characteristics is these chemical reactions are very specific in nature. So an antibody will interact only with the antigen which caused its production. So these are very specific interactions between antigens and antibodies. And because of their specificity, we use them in serological assays. That is in the determination of serum to find out whether an antibody is present in the serum and if it is present at what concentration it is present in the serum. So because of the specificity of these uh, interactions between the antigens and antibodies, these are used for serological testings. We can use them for serum surveys to find out what proportion of population has antibodies against a particular we use them for diagnostic purposes to find out about a disease-causing agent and whether that disease-causing agent is present in the patient or not. Right? Another thing which we already discussed is the analytes should be soluble. For precipitation reaction, the antigen and the antibodies, they have to be soluble. They will interact, give us an insoluble product. And that insoluble product should be visible. Right? Antibody for this should be polyphore. And the antigen also should have at least two different binding sites. Because precipitation means they have to cross link with each other. So if they have only one binding site, there will be no cross linking. So there has to be at least two binding sites present for the interactions to take place. So antigen also has to be at least bivalent. Or preferably it should be a multivalent molecule. So if we take a polyclonal antibody and we take a bi or multivalent antigen, they will interact. The interactions are mostly non-covalent in nature. So what type of interactions are there? There will be hydrogen bonding, there will be hydrophobic bonding, there will be van der Waals interaction, and there are electrostatic interactions between the antigens and the antibodies. So which areas specifically interact with each other? Those areas are known as epitopes and pyrotopes. So what's an epitope? It's a binding site on the antigen. Very nice. So an antigen mostly is a complex. It is made up of uh, proteins, glycoproteins. There are polysaccharides, there are lipids, there are lipopolysaccharides, there are nucleic acids. So all these sites which are present on the antigen, if they can elicit the production of an antibody, we call it an epitope. So epitope is also known as antigenic determinant. It's also known as immunodeterminant. Right? So epitopes are binding sites of the antigen. Antigens mostly are complex molecules. They are made up of many different types of molecules. And if that molecule elicits a production of an antibody, we call that particular molecule or that particular molecular site 
as the electron. So what is the parallel? Parallel will be the bonding of that Correct. It's a binding site on the antigen. So epitopes are the binding sites on the antigens, also known as antigenic determinants. Paratopes are the binding sites on the antigens. So non-covalent interactions will then take place between the epitopes and the paratopes. And when these antigens and antibodies exist at optimal proportions, they will cross-link with each other. They will form lattice. Lattice is a three-dimensional network. You can understand like a matrix, a mesh kind of structure, which is formed when the antigen and antibodies, they exist at optimal proportions. Now here, optimal proportions, we don't need a ratio of 1 is to 1. An optimal proportion means the crosslinks formed between the antigen and antibody should be big enough, should be large enough to precipitate out of the solution. Right? So how do we understand these optimal concentrations? A hypothesis was given in 1934, and this hypothesis was given by Harak. Now, this can be understood if we, uh, you suppose you have a series of tubes, right? In each tube, you add the same amount of antibody, and you increase the concentration of antigen in the tubes. Now, in initial tubes, what will happen? The amount of antibody is in excess, the initial tubes. You are adding a little bit amount of antigen and then you keep on increasing the concentration of antigen. You have a series of tubes. In each tube, the amount of anti antibody is same. It's constant. What we are wearing is the concentration of the antigen. Right? So initial tubes will over. Initial tubes will have more antibodies than antigen. This zone is known as an antibody excess zone. So what will happen? There will be epitope present on the antigen, the paratopes present on the antibodies. They will cross link, no, no doubt, they will cross link. But because there are not many molecules of antigens, the cross links are very small, the lattices formed are very small. So they will not precipitate out from the solution. Then you keep on increasing the concentration of antigen. As you increase the concentration of antigen, as you can see here, there are many antigens. Each antigen will be either bivalent or multivalent. They will have two or more than two binding sites present. And these binding sites will attach or will interact with the paratopes. And these will cross-link with each other. When the cross-links become big enough, they precipitate out of the solution. This zone, where we can see precipitation, is known as the equivalent zone. Now, in further tubes, what you are doing is you keep on adding the antigen. Now, the antigen becomes the excess. Antibody is constant. You keep on increasing the antigen. The precipitate will not keep on increasing. Why? Because the binding sites now increase. Uh, the epitopes now increase much higher than the paratopes which are present. So, each antibody now can bind to independent antigen. There are too many antigens present. They don't need to cross it. They can bind to individual antigens. And now, because they are binding to individual antigens, again, there will be no cross -link. So, precipitate will then decrease. This zone, this phenomena, which we see in antibody excess zone, is also known as a pro-zone phenomena. Right? This is an equivalent zone. The phenomena that we see where the antibody is in excess is known as a pro-zone phenomena. The phenomena which we see here, where there is antigen excess, is known as a post-zone phenomenon. This curve that we can plot, where the antigen concentration is being varied. On the x-axis, there is antigen added and we are varying the concentration of this antigen against the antibody which is being precipitated out. This curve is known as a precipitation curve. Yeah. Now, precipitation reactions can be performed in liquid media. You can also perform it in semi-solid media. Now, there are advantages of using semi-solid media over liquid media. One is semi-solid media will give you the precipitin bands or the precipitin lines which are easily visible. 
Right? Here, when we are performing a leak, we are also calling the ring test, or you might have done the flocculation test, which are very, uh, you cannot uh, preserve these for longer times. But precipitants that are formed, they can be preserved by staining. So, semi solid medium, we have to do advantage. It is clearly visible as a precipitate in the form of a precipitant ring or in the form of a precipitant line. And we can preserve it for longer times by staining. So, we can either use liquid or we can use a semi solid medium. Semi solid medium can be gel like agar or agarose, mostly. Agar is complex sulfated polysaccharides which we obtain from seeds. Agarose is purified agar. Agarose is preferred. It is very good. It is uncharged. Because it's uncharged, it will not interfere in the interactions between the articles and articles. Remember, they are non covalent interactions. Non covalent, they are electrostatic interactions as well. So, agarose is uncharged, so it doesn't interfere with the interactions between the epitopes and the paratopes. So, therefore, this is a preferred gel material that we use for the precipitation reactions. Right? But we can also use non gel support. One of them is cellulose acetate. We need a support medium where the antigens and antibodies they can diffuse towards each other. Right? They can interact, they can form a precipitate. So you can use liquid media. When we use liquid media, we mostly call it ring test or the flocculation test also comes under this. Or we can use a semi-solid media like gel or non-gel support medium can be used. Now when we perform these uh, reactions in semi-solid media, we specifically call it immunodiffusion. That is diffusion of antigens and antibodies. Immuno means antigens and antibodies. They are diffusing, they are interacting, they are forming the precipitate. These precipitation reactions, when they are in vitro used for diagnostic tests, we also call them immunodiffusion. So what we do in immunodiffusion, because today we will be uh, practically doing immunodiffusion. So what we do here is, we will prepare the gel. And after the gel solidifies, we will cut wells in the gel, we will punch holes in the gel. And in these wells, we fill the samples. Right? These samples can either be antigen, the sample can be antibody, or it can be both. You can fill the wells either with the antigen or with the antibody or with both the antigens and the antibodies. Then we incubate them. And allow them to interact with each other, allow them to diffuse in the medium. And this is done for starting from 18 hours, you can go up to 72 hours also. Right? Some interactions take more time. So 24 to 48 hours is optimal, which we keep these plates in the incubator and we allow them to react with each other. And at the equivalence point, which point? The equivalence zone point, they will precipitate and you can visualize a precipitate ring or you can visualize a precipitate ring. So these immunodiffusion reactions, there are different methods of immunodiffusion. And these methods are basically based on two criteria. One criteria is whether you are uh, allowing only one analyte to diffuse. It can either be antigen or it can be antigen. Or you are allowing both the analytes to diffuse. That is, both antigen and antibodies are allowed to diffuse. So, your diffusion reaction can be single or it can be double. Single means one is fixed, one is allowed to move. Double means both are allowed to move. Second criteria of these methods is whether they are moving in one direction or they are moving in two directions. So there are two criteria: single immunodiffusion in one dimension, single immunodiffusion in two dimensions, double immunodiffusion in one dimension, double immunodiffusion in two dimensions. So I have listed all these four here. The first one is Odin method. Odin method means single immunodiffusion 
in one dimension. This is a picture that depicts Odin with immunodiffusion. What we do here is we prepare the gel. And in the gel, we add the antibody. Now, when you mix antibody in the gel, it is fixed. Right? And this agar or this gel solution containing the antibody is then layered with the sample containing the antigen. And this antigen is allowed to diffuse into the gel. Right? So it is just moving in one direction, that is vertically. And only one of the analyte is moving. So this is single immunodiffusion in one direction. Right? So all in method is single immunodiffusion in one dimension. Oakley Fulthorpe method, Oakley Fulthorpe procedure is double immunodiffusion in one dimension. So because it is double, you will allow both of them to move. So again, we prepare the gel. We add antibody. We layer it with another agar gel, which is plain. Plain means you don't add antibody or antigen. You just layer it on the lower gel, right? And above this plain agar, we will layer our sample containing the antigen, which should be soluble, obviously. And both the antigens, they will, the antigens as well as the antibody, they will move. And in this plain agar, wherever their influence zone is met, they will form a crystal. So here both of them are moving, antigen is moving, antibody is also moving. So it is double in your direction. But they are moving just in one direction. They are moving only vertically. And so this double immunodiffusion in one dimension. That is also opening full top precision. Now coming to radial, which you are performing today, radial is also single immunodiffusion. Single now you understand. You are keeping one analyte constant. That analyte can be antibody, but analyte can be antibody. And the other one is allowed to diffuse in the gel. But here you will diffuse in both the directions. They will diffuse vertically, as we see here, and they will also diffuse horizontally. So it is single immunodiffusion in two dimensions, right? Then we have autoron. This is also known as double immunodiffusion. Double immunodiffusion because both the analytes will move. So now we understand single, one is moving, double, for are moving. So it's double immunodiffusion which tells us one thing that both the antigen and the antibody will diffuse towards each other. And it is in two dimensions. So they will diffuse both vertically as well as they will diffuse horizontally. So we have double immunodiffusion in two dimensions. Now these are passive methods. You are just adding the analyte in the well, they are diffusing out and they are interacting with each other. If you help it in some way, if you provide some A, like in this case, we are providing electricity. They are moving in presence of or with the help of electric current. We call them electro immuno diffusion or immuno electrophoresis. One of them is rocket that we will be performing on Monday, right? So that is electro immuno diffusion. Immuno diffusion, but in presence of some help. Rest of these are passive in your life. You're not providing any help. They're just loading the sample, they are diffusing out into the gel, interacting with each other, forming a precipitate that is insoluble, that is visible, and that you can preserve for longer time by staying. Right? So what are the advantages of these reactions? The first and main is they are very specific. They are very uh, selective. And every curve will interact only with the specific corresponding homologous antibody. Right? So antibody will interact only with that antigen which caused its production, which stimulated its production. So these are very selective, very specific techniques to study uh, interaction between antigen and antibodies in serological assays, in zero surveys, in diagnostics. We use this because these are very specific reactions. 
Then they are very easy to perform. You just have to prepare a gel. That is not difficult. You have to punch wells. You have to load your sample. And you just incubate it. You give it proper conditions, pH, temperature, electrolytes, they will be out. Right? So they are very easy to perform. They are inexpensive. The only expensive thing would be the analyte. Rest of the things are not very expensive. And it doesn't require much equipment. It can be done with very small, very little equipment. You just need a glass slide or a petri plate in which you can make the gel. To punch the wells, you can use a gel puncher. If you don't have a gel puncher, you can also use the back of the tip microfiber tip. You can punch wells, right? So it doesn't require uh, too much equipment. And another advantage is that if your sample is not pure, it doesn't contain only one antigen. Each antigen will interact differently with the antibodies. So you can also separate a mixture of antigens. So if you don't have a pure sample, you can also test whether your sample is pure. You can get more number of bands if there are no number of antigens present in the sample. So these large number of antigens are present. Each antigen antibody reaction will give rise to a separate line or a separate band of resistance. So these are the advantages of the immunodiffusion reactions. Um, Okay. So what are the disadvantages? Disadvantages, uh, you require fairly high concentration of analytes. It is not a very sensitive technique. Very sensitive means there is a lower limit which will give you a reaction. For example, in radial immunodiffusion, the lower limit is around 0.5 milligrams per liter. So if you go below that, you will not get a reaction. So there is a high concentration of analyte that is required for these reactions to take place. Next disadvantage is that it requires very long incubation times. Sometimes you also have to incubate your sample for 72 hours. So starting from say about 18 hours, mostly we keep it for 24 hours, we keep it overnight. But some antigen-antibody interactions take up to 72 hours to give you the uh, end point of reaction. So long incubation times are required. You can require large amount of analytes, large amount of antibodies required. And therefore, it's not a very sensitive uh, method for lower concentration of the analytes, the antigens as well as the antibodies. Nietzsche. So now let's look at the radial immunodiffusion. What protocol we will be following today? So before moving to radial immunodiffusion, is precipitation here? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma 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 yes, also abbreviated as SRI. And now we know that this method is uh, because it is a single, that means one of the analyte you will fix. The other analyte you will load in the well 
and it will be allowed to diffuse out in the wells. So you have also we really prepare the uh, gel. We incorporate, say for example, antibody in the gel. We pour this gel on a glass slide, let it solidify, and then we punch wells. And in the wells, we will then load the antigen sample of different concentrations, both standard as well as test. Standard means where you know the concentration, and test means where you don't know the concentration. So you have then you integrate this, give it proper conditions, and you will get the precipitin rings. The diameter of these precipitin rings tells us about the concentration of the antigen in the sample. Right? So radial immunodiffusion, these are the conventional methods. This is classic precipitation reactions, where antigens and antibodies will react to give us a precipitin ring in the semi-solid. Is it both qualitative mm -hmm. and quantitative? This is, is quantitative. This is quantitative. Qualitative also. Because we are seeing that. If so you don't get a ring, mm -hmm. that means the antigen and antibodies are not specific. Mm -hmm. But there are other uh, reasons also why you cannot get a ring. Maybe you didn't. Uh, maybe what happens is if you uh, put the antibody in the gel, the agarose, you fed the agarose gel, you melt the agarose mm -hmm. basically by boiling. And if you add the antibody to the gel uh, when the temperature is about 60, it might be nature. Yes. It might inactivate the antibody. Then also you will not get a ring. So that uh, you need to be sure that you have performed it properly. And if after all the troubleshootings you have checked, you have performed it properly, you're not getting a ring, that means the specificity is not present. Right? The antigen antibodies are not specific to each other. But otherwise, you will get a ring. And this is a quantitative assay because you can find out the concentration of the antigen in the sample. Or vice versa. If you are uh, fixing the antigen, you can find out the concentration of the antibody in the sample. Right? So, what are the steps? What we will do today is we will first prepare the agarose gel. What is important is this gel, I'll give you the protocol. So here just to understand. We'll prepare the antigen and we'll not add the antigen. Antigen means the antibody solution that we have. We will not add it if the temperature is above 60 degrees Celsius. That might inactivate the antibody. These are protein molecules. Protein gets inactivated above 60. So logically, you should go be, uh, below 60. Not much below because it's a semi-solid medium. It will start solid solid. And then your antiserum will not mix homogeneously in the gel. So we keep the temperature approximately around 55, 60. Not taking it to the thermometer, but you have to keep it down to 65, 55 to 60. Right? Your antiserum, you mix it into the uh, gel and then you pour it on a glass plate, which should be clean. You wipe it with the alcohol dipped cotton and on the clean glass plate you will pour this sample. And then you allow it to set for about 30 minutes. If the gel solidifies, what we do is we place it we place this glass plate on the template. The template is nothing, it's a paper on which there will be markings. And these markings are where you have to put the standard sample and where you have to put the test sample, right? So there are, uh, what we are doing today, there are four uh, standards, A, B, C, B. The concentration will range from 3.75 to 30 milligrams per ml. 3.75, uh, then 7.5. Then 15 and then 17. So known concentrations we will load in the A, B, C and D wells. There are two test samples given. So we will load them in E and F. So after your gel solidifies on the glass plate, we will place the glass plate on the template, which is provided in the kit. And we will punch wells using a gel puncher corresponding to the markings given on the template we will punch the And then in each of the well, we will add the sample. 
10 microliters of the sample of both standard as well as test, we will load into the wells. And these wells we incubate in a moist chamber at 37 degrees Celsius. This is important. Why? The gel should not dry. Right? Otherwise it will not move. Otherwise it will not move. Very nice. Otherwise it will not move. Agarose mm -hmm. gel, they're porous. And yeah, the sample has to move through the pores. So if the gel dries, that will shut down the pores. And your sample will not be able to move. So what we do is, uh, it's moving on into after I thought it's moving on its own. Okay. So how do we prepare this moisture? What we do is we have this glass plate, this line on which we have the sample. We will place this uh, glass slide uh, in a petri dish and in that petri dish we will place cotton. And that cotton should be moist so that your gel doesn't dry. So that, that way how we will create the moist chamber and we will integrate it at 27 degrees in an incubator obviously. In an incubator we will integrate it at 27 degrees for 24 to 48 hours. So we'll see the result of the right? So what will be the result? It needs to Yes. So what will we observe? We will observe for precipitate base, right? This type of result we will get. We loaded the samples here. There are four standards, remember? These are 3.75 mg per ml, 7.5 mg per ml, 15 mg per ml, and 30 mg per ml. So you've loaded these standard in these four wells, and also you have to test samples. You have the test antigen 1, you have the test antigen 2. So what we need to do is we need to measure the diameter of the the diameter of the ring is proportional to the concentration of the antigen in the sample. So you just have to, using a scale, you just have to uh, measure the diameter, including the diameter of the well. You will measure the diameter of the zone that we will get, and then we will plot the curve. That curve is known as a standard curve for radial immunoglobulin. Now to plot the standard curve, you will use a semi-log paper. Here you will uh, plot the antigen concentrations. You have 3.75, 7.5, 15 and 30. And corresponding diameter that you get at all the concentrations. Right? And you plot this curve, standard curve. And what would we can find out from the standard curve? We can find out the concentration of the unknown sample. Unknown sample will also give you a ring. You measure the diameter of that ring. You plot that on the standard curve. You extrapolate it to the x-axis and you get the concentration of the unknown sample. So it's basically a quantitative test. You have a standard curve, you should have a standard curve, and from the standard curve, you can find out the concentration of the unknown in the sample. Right? Now there is one limitation here also. Suppose you have an unknown sample and its reading goes beyond the level of this line that you are getting. You cannot extend this line. Because in radial immunodiffusion, you don't know whether it will give you a linear relationship or not. Right? So if your reading goes beyond what you can extrapolate on this line, you have to take other steps. Right? You cannot extend this line and plot your samples. And then you have to perform the experiment again. With New other standards. If you have uh, you have beyond this value, then you have to take standards which are beyond this value. 
so that you find out what is the relationship, what line you are getting, and then you can uh, plot your unknown and extrapolate it to the x-axis, right? So what are the applications? Now we know you can determine the concentration of antigen in the sample using this technique. You can estimate the concentration of antibodies in the serum and you can also estimate the immunoglobulin classes in the serum. You use this technique for disease diagnostics. So this is used in diagnostic immunology. Small laboratory still use this technique for diagnostic testing. Right? Serological surveys, as I said, to find out how what proportion of population has antibodies against a particular uh, pathogen, against a particular disease causing agent. Right? You can also, uh, apart from measuring the immunoglobulins, you can also measure other proteins. You can measure the complement proteins. The complement proteins are a group of proteins which help the immune system to clear the antigen antibody complex which from the system. That is one of the functions of the complement proteins to clear the antigen antibody complexes also. And then there are acute phase proteins. These are mostly released at the time of inflammation. So you can also detect for the presence for the concentration not only of immunoglobulins but also of the acute phase proteins as well as the complement proteins. Or other serum and plasma proteins can also be quantified using the single radial immunodistribution proteins. Right? Make up. So next we have double in two dimensions. Double immunodiffusion in two dimensions, also commonly known as the autolony double diffusion. That is by autolony. The year was around 1948 when this technique was devised. And this is also based on the precipitation reactions as we know now. Autolony. So this technique is it used to check anti-serum for the presence of antibodies qualitative also to determine its level in the serum to determine its titer value for the it's a semi-quantitative so you can check the anti-serum for the presence of antibodies you can also find out the titer value of the analyte called double immunodiffusion because here the wells that you are cutting in the gel will be loaded both with the antigen as well as the antibodies. The antigen and antibodies both will move horizontally as well as vertically. They are moving in both the directions, both of them are moving so it is a double immunodiffusion in two dimensions also known as Ocolony method, devised by Ocolony in 1948. So what are the steps? Again, we prepare gel, preferably agros. You can also use acrylamide, but we prefer agros gel. Agros gel prepared in acid buffer, like we did in radial, you will pour it on the plastic. What is the difference? Here we are not adding anti serum to the gel because we will allow both of them to diffuse. So we are not adding the anti serum in the gel, we are just preparing this gel in the buffer and we are pouring it on the glass plate and we will allow the gel to set for 30 minutes. And using a gel punch you will punch wells. Now because we also can find out the tighter value, so we need to make dilutions of the dilution of the antibody sample. Right? So we serially dilute this test at the serum up to 1 is to 32 dilutions. For doing this, we will take 5 tubes. In each tube, we will add 10 microliter of the acid. 
So each tube will be having 10 microliters of the assay buffer. In the first tube, we will add 10 microliters of anti serum. We will mix it. This is 1 is to 2. From here, we will take 10 microliters, transfer it to the second tube. This is 1 is to 2. Similarly, from here, we will take 10 microliters, transfer it to the third tube, make 1 is to 8, and 1 is to 16, and 1 is to 32. Right? So we serially dilute with a anti serum up to 1 is to 32 dilution. Then what we will do is, these are the wells that we punched by placing the glass slide on its template that is provided in the kit. There is a well for the antigen and surrounding this central well of the antigen there are wells for the antibodies. One is written undiluted, that means the antiserum is loaded into this and these are the dilutions which we have already made, 1 is to 2, 1 is to 4, 1 is to 8, 1 is to 16, and 1 is to 22. So in each well, we have to load 10 microliter of the sample, both the antigen as well as the antiserum. And then what we do, we will intubate it at 37 degrees Celsius in a moist chamber. We know how to make a moist chamber. Take a petri dish, moist cotton, place it in the petri dish, put your glass line on the moist cotton, cover it and then place it in the petri dish. Right? So, 37 degrees Celsius, we have to incubate 24 to 48 hours. What will we observe here? Single may we observe ring. Double may we observe Line. These lines are known as precipitin lines. So we will observe for precipitin line between the antigen well and the antiserum well. Right? And how to find out the title? The highest dilution of the antiserum where this line is formed is the title value of the sample. So here was the antigen. Here was the undiluted sample, 1 is to 2, 1 is to 4, 1 is to 8, 1 is to 16, and 1 is to 32. So according to this, we have a title value of 1 is to 8. Right? So this is the highest dilution at which the precipitin line is formed. That is the title value of the anti C. So in radio, we get rings. In autonomy, we get lines. So, the so these dilution is at one is to thirty-two. At which we are getting the precipitin line. We're not getting any line here. Right? We're not getting any line here. Starting from the undiluted sample and it's going to this direction. Okay, we are counting from the So the highest dilution where you can observe a line, that is the tighter value of your sample. Right. So these are also used for studies of evolution. 
find out the relationships between the antigens. How do we do it? This is how we do it. You place the antiserum against which you are checking whether the two antigens are identical or not identical. And you place the antigens in the wells. The two antigens that you are comparing, you will place them in the wells, the antiserum in the third well, and then you allow them to interact. Right? If these two antigens are same, if they are identical, they will interact identically with the antibodies. And you get a V-shaped precipitin pattern. So this pattern is also known as a pattern of identity. This tells us, this pattern tells us that these two antigens are identical. Identical means they have identical efficacy. They have identical binding sites on the surface. If they get this kind of line, they are joining also, but you get a spur towards one antigen. Which means most of the antigens, uh, the epitopes on the antigens are common. But there are some epitopes which are different. So this uh, pattern that we get is also known as the pattern of partial identity. Right? So this is identical. These are partially identical. Most of the epitopes are common and some epitopes are different. And then we have these two antigens where they are crossing with each other. The precipitin lines are crossing with each other, suggesting that they have their own epitopes and these have their own epitopes. So there is no identity between these two antigens. To find out whether these two antigens are identical, they are partially identical or they are non-identical, this autonomy double-replication can be used. So this technique is also used to test for the toxigenicity of some bacterial strains. So in case of for any bacteria diphtheria, there is a test which is known as NF test. That NF test also uses autonomy double-replication to find out whether a particular strain is producing a toxin or not producing a toxin by reacting the toxin with its antigen. That is also where we can use the double immuno diffusion techniques. Clear? So these are the applications of the autonomy double diffusion. The radio double diff immuno diffusion is also known as a Mancini method. I forgot to mention first. Autonomy uh, was devised by autonomy around 1948. Radial immunodiffusion is also known as a Mancini test. Mancini developed it around 1965. So single radial immunodiffusion is also known as Mancini test. Right? So can we go to the experiment part now? Yes. I have a question. Yes. Why are we preparing severe diffusions? To find out the type of value, to find out what why, are the, so why do we have to dilute the, that antigen to find the tidal value? How will you find it otherwise? And why wouldn't you find it undiluted? Undiluted, you have one concentration only. You don't know what is the level of the concentrations, right? That, that can only be found out if you serially dilute the sample. And right? that is why we are serially diluting. To find out what is the level in the serum. Otherwise, you just have one sample. You don't know what is the concentration in that, right? What is the level of antibody or what is the type of value? Can only be found out if you dilute that sample and find out which portion is giving you the result. Right? So that is what we are doing. Correct? Anything else? Can we start? Yes, yes.
बैठ जाओ उधर को देखो मन नीचे पता चल जाएगा कि कोई नहीं है वहां हेलो हेलो छोटा भी करें किसे और बनाने के लिए वैसे वाला नहीं है वैसे वाला नहीं है एक और है किसी को चाहिए तो एक साइड मीडियम है दूसरे साइड ऑटो आ रही है तो ये स्टार्टिंग विद रेडियो फर्स्ट एरियस वी आर मेकिंग द बफर ऐसे बफर जो किट में ऐसे बफर दिया है वो टेनेक्स है व्हाट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ टेनेक्स इट्स सेंट टाइम्स फॉर द टेनेक्स राइट एंड वी हैव टू प्रिपेयर द जेल इन वन एक्स कैन यू टू टाइम यू दिस टेनेक्स को वन एक्स कैसे बनाते हैं You take one ml of the buffer, the tenex buffer, and you add nine ml of sterile distilled water. Okay? Buffer number. Because.
तुम्हारा चेहरा नहीं आ रहा क्या बात लाइव आना चाहिए ना
लेकिन जरा ठंडा करो तो ही सोलह
वो प्लेट का है मैंने क्लास वन परसेंट वन परसेंट उसी बार बनेगा ना बफर एक बात ओपन कर दिया एक बार इसमें के लिए अलग बने हम दोनों का जो उसी को ना वो फर्स्ट पार्ट तो आपने जन बना दिया अब सेकंड पार्ट उसको डीप करने के लिए देखो वही तो कहां है पिछले सेंटर का लोड करो 
प्रोसीजर हो जाना चाहिए ना कैमरे के सामने
खींचे 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 रहना रहना तो ठीक है और यहाँ तक अभी बन के
अब देखो सब पे लिखा है जो टेम्पलेट पे है वही लिखा होगा ना देखो ऐसे लेना ए वाला बी वाला आएगा बी में फिर आएगा सी वाला
हो जाएगा ऊपर ये तो तीन दिन में नहीं इधर वो तो ऊपर रखे वगैरह रखे बार बार ऐसे कर ज़्यादा ये मूवमेंट नहीं होना चाहिए ना ऐसे कर इसको परपेंडिकुलर में प्रेयर करना है एक दो आदमी भी तो नहीं करने वाला इसको थोड़ी थोड़ी
ऐसे पकड़ के करवा लोगे ना बना लोगे ना ऐसे बोल जैसे फिर वो कर दिया बड़ा कर दिया उसका पहले वाला प्रैक्टिस कर रहा है हां इसके साथ क्यों ऐसा हो रहा है क्योंकि सुहाग का पसीना है आज मैंने सिर्फ मैंने पहले पकड़ा और इसको मैं कर देता हूं पूरा मैं कर देता हूं और इसको मैं कर देता हूं क्या कर बन गया भाई हमारे ये दे ये दे अभी वो कर ले फिर फिक्स और डिपेंड है ना तो सेम जैसे इसमें हमने किया है उसमें से निकालो सारी चीजें एक पैकेट में अलग से होंगे ये चेक कर लो वैसे ही
रिपोर्ट लगा रहेगा तभी तो पता लगेगा